During the first quarter of each home game, Stargirl went over to the visitors section and gave them a cheer. She began with an exaggerated ball bouncing motion. Dribble, dribble, sis, boom, bibble. We don't bite, we don't nibble. We just say, sweeping wave, howdy friends. Two thumbs pointing to her chest. We're the electrons, pointing to them. Who are you? Turns head to the side, cups ear. A couple of visiting cheerleaders, maybe a fan or two, would call back, Wildcats or Cougars or whatever, but most of them just gaped at her as if to say, Who is this? Some of her fellow cheerleaders were amused. Some were mortified. At that point, the only crime Stargirl could have been accused of would be corniness. But she didn't stop there. She cheered whenever the ball went in the basket, regardless of which team shot it. It was the strangest sight. The other team scores, the Moz crowd sits glumly on their hands while Stargirl alone pops up cheering. At first, the other cheerleaders tried to suppress her. It was like trying to calm down a puppy. When they gave her the pleated skirt, they made a cheerleader they never imagined. She did not limit herself to basketball games. She cheered anyone, anything, anytime. She cheered the big things, honors, election winners, but she gave most of her attention to little things. You never knew when it would happen. Maybe you were a little ninth grade nobody named Eddie. As you're walking down the hall, you see a candy wrapper on the floor. You pick it up and throw it in the nearest trash can. And suddenly, there she is in front of you, pumping her arms, her honey hair and freckles flying, swallowing you whole with those enormous eyes, belting out a cheer. She's making up on the spot something about Eddie, Eddie, and the trash can teaming up to wipe out litter. A mob is gathering, clapping hands and rhythm, more eyes on you than all the previous days of your life combined. You feel foolish, exposed, stupid. You want to follow the candy wrapper into the trash can. It's the most painful thing that's ever happened to you. Your brain keeps squirting out a single thought, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And so when she finally finishes and her freckles settle back onto the bridge of her nose, why don't you? Why don't you just die? Because they're clapping for you, that's why. And whoever heard of dying while they're clapping for you and they're smiling at you. People who never even saw you before are smiling at you and slapping your back and pumping your hand. And suddenly it seems like the whole world is calling your name and you're feeling so good. You pretty much just float on home from school. And when you go to bed that night, the last thing you see before you zonk out are those eyes. And the last thing on your face is a smile. Or maybe you show up at school with really unusual earrings, or you aced a test, or you broke your arm, or got your braces off, or maybe you weren't even a person. Maybe you were a charcoal drawing on the wall done by an art whiz, or a really neat-looking bug out by the bike rack. We wagged our heads and agreed what a goofy girl this was, maybe even officially crazy, but we walked away smiling, and maybe not saying, but all thinking the same thing. It felt good to get credit. And if this had been any other year, things might have just gone on and on like that. But this was the year something unbelievable was happening on the basketball court. This was the year the team was winning. Only winning. And that changed everything. Early in the season, no one noticed. Except for girls' tennis, we had never had good teams in anything. We expected to lose. We were comfortable with losing. In fact, most of us were oblivious to it since we didn't even attend the games. The year before, the Basketball Electrons had won only five of 26 games. This year, they won their fifth game before Christmas. By early January, they had won the 10th, and people began to notice that there was still a zero in the loss column. Undefeated, blared a sign on the Plywood Roadrunner. Some said we were winning by accident. Some said the other teams were simply more rotten than we were. Some thought the sign was a joke. One thing was certain, attendance went up. By the start of February, the winning streak had reached 16 and there wasn't an empty seat in the gym. But something even more interesting was happening. Suddenly, we were no longer comfortable with losing. In fact, we forgot how to lose. The transformation was stunning in its speed. There was no apprenticeship period, no learning curve. No one had to teach us how to be winners. One day we were bored, indifferent, satisfied losers. The next we were rabid fanatics, stomping in the grandstand, painting our faces green and white, doing the wave as if we had been perfecting it for years. We fell in love with our team. When we spoke of it, we used the word we instead of they. The leading scorer, Brent Ardsley, 
seemed to have a golden glow about him as he moved through the school. And the more we loved our team, the more we hated the opposition. We used to envy them. We even applauded them to spite our own hapless teams. Now we detested the opposition and everything about them. We hated their uniforms. We hated coaches and their fans. We hated them because they were trying to spoil our perfect season. We resented every point scored against us. And how dare they celebrate? We began to boo. It was our first experience as booers, but you'd have thought we were veterans. We booed the other team. We booed the other coach. We booed the other fans, the referees, who, whatever threatened our perfect season, we booed it. We even booed the scoreboard. We hated games that went down to the wire. We hated suspense. We loved games that were decided in the first five minutes. We wanted more than victories. We wanted massacres. The only score we would have been totally happy with would have been 100 to zero. And right there in the middle of it all, in the midst of this perfect season mania, was Stargirl popping up whenever the ball went through the net, no matter which team scored. Cheering everything and everybody. It was sometime in January when calls started flying from the stands. Sit down! Then came the booze. She didn't seem to notice. She did not seem to notice. Of all the unusual features of Stargirl, this struck me as the most remarkable. Bad things did not stick to her. Correction. Her bad things did not stick to her. Our bad things stuck very much to her. If we were hurt, if we were unhappy or otherwise victimized by life, she seemed to know about it and to care as soon as we did. But bad things falling on her, unkind words, nasty stares, foot blisters, she seemed unaware of. I never saw her look in a mirror, never heard her complain. All of her feelings, all of her attentions flowed outward. She had no ego. The 19th game of the basketball season was played at Red Rock. In previous years, cheerleaders had outnumbered Micah fans at away games. Not now. The convoy rolling across the desert that evening stretched for a couple of miles. By the time we were seated, there was barely room for the home team fans. It was the worst slaughter of the year. Red Rock was helpless. By the start of the fourth quarter, we were ahead 78 to 29. The coach put in the subs. We booed. We smelled 100 points. We wanted blood. The coach put the starters back in. As we howled and thundered in the stands, Stargirl got up and walked from the gym. Those of us who noticed assumed she was going to the restroom. I kept glancing toward the exit. She never returned. With five seconds left in the game, the Electrons scored the hundredth point. We went nuts. Stargirl had been outside the whole time chatting with the bus driver. The other cheerleaders asked her why she left. She said she felt sorry for the Red Rock players. She felt her cheering was only making the massacre worse. Such games were no fun, she said. Your job isn't to have fun, they told her. Your job is to cheer for Micah High no matter what. She just stared at them. The team and the cheerleaders rode the same bus. The, when the players came out from the locker room, the cheerleaders told them what had happened. They devised a trick. They told Stargirl that someone had forgotten something in the gym, and would she please go get it? With Stargirl gone, they told the bus driver everyone was aboard, and the bus made the two-hour return trip without her. A Red Rock custodian drove her home that night. Next day in school, the cheerleaders told her it was all a big misunderstanding and acted as if they were sorry. She believed them. The next day was February 13th, the hot seat. 